Namaste, and welcome to our new series, To Sleep, Perchance to Dream. <laughs> this is a quote from Shakespeare, from Hamlet, because he was having bad dreams, inauspicious dreams, warning him of the tragedy that would be the future, or his future. <laughs> but we can have dreams that actually enlighten us and show us our destination, our destiny, our form and nature in the next life, and even the people and world around us in the next life, in the future, as we shall become. And how do we become? <laughs> These are all secrets of the dream state and the deep sleep state. So we will be going deeply into those secrets based on the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. And only one chapter of that Upanishad, uh, which is a vast ocean of amazing, deep knowledge about human nature, consciousness, and the world. Uh, that one chapter is an excerpt from a conversation between a great sage and a king. And in the previous video, actually the first video of this series, I link to a PDF of that chapter. Now you should download that PDF and have it open in a different window or even better on a different device uh, with a large screen so you can read it and follow along with us as we go through this chapter, this amazing chapter. If you look at the PDF, the first page looks like this. It's just basically a huge work, a very big, big, deep, and text-heavy work on philosophy. So you will be reading from that copy, that version, I will be reading from my study version, which looks like this. I'm using a software called Liquid Text. And basically what I've done is annotated different portions of the text that reflect different types of material. For example, the important teachings are in green, purple are quotations from elsewhere in the Upanishad, or other Upanishads or Vedas. And later on you'll see yellow highlights the verses, the shlokas or mantras themselves. So we're going to go through this literally sentence by sentence. I was having a problem because <laughs> I could see that the comprehension of our viewers of this material was not, you know, very good. <laughs> so uh, I meditated on it, did a little ceremony, and what I realized, what was revealed to me uh, during that ceremony or a little bit afterwards, was that I've been going too fast. Uh, now, because of my training, because of my background, um, I can assimilate vast quantities of information. So not everybody has that background or training. Uh, and if you want to know about that, check out our series on matrix learning. But if you want to learn about consciousness, if you want to learn about the real nature of human life, these Upanishads give complete explanations of not only consciousness, but sleep, dreams, God, <laughs> and the relations among all those things based on the realization of the self, with a capital S. The self is Brahman, or how can I say, the reservoir of existence, consciousness, and bliss. So this is what people call, without understanding what it really is, they call it God. And then they apply all kinds of imaginary 
uh, personalities, you know, like those old comic books. They have a, a like a picture of a doll and then different dresses and different outfits that you can cut out and paste over the doll. Well, it's kind of the same thing that people do with God. The reality of God is Brahman. But people cut and paste all kinds of ideas from different religious books, which are, frankly, imagination, dreams. And how those things are dreams, and why they are dreams, and how they work as dreams, and how to wake up from those dreams, is what this chapter is about. So let's begin. The connection of the present section with the preceding portion is as follows. Well, I just explained what the connection of this series is with the previous series. And to add a little more background, we've been going through the Mandukya Upanishad. And Mandukya explains these four states of consciousness. Here they are. So far, we've covered Jagrat. And we're just beginning to cover the Svapna and Sushupti stages, preliminary to realizing the Turiya stage. But I found in these presentations, based on the feedback and comments on the channel I've been getting, that these explanations given in the Mandukya Upanishad, although they're accurate and pithy, you know, very essential, very laconic. They are not sufficient to overcome the many, many stories and actually lies that we've been told about these states. For example, dreaming has been called the subconscious mind in psychology, and deep sleep has been called the collective unconscious but actually, neither of these states are subconscious or unconscious. Rather, they're simply different states of consciousness with different objects. And so, this section is going to explain all this completely, leaving you with a complete understanding of your consciousness, your daily experience. Because everybody goes through these four states of consciousness every day all the time, jumping from one to another as our attention focuses on different tasks. So, we're going to go deep into this. Next sentence. The individual self, the Brahman that is immediate and direct, the self that is within all, is identical with the Supreme Self. The individual self is identical with the Supreme Self. There is no difference at all. Though well, then, how do all these individual beings arise? And why do they go through so many transformations and changes and so on? Well, that's exactly what we're going to explain. <laughs> Meanwhile, I draw your attention to the purple text, which is a quote from a previous verse in Brihadaranyakapanishad 3.4.1. Then Ushasta, the son of Chakra, asked him, Yajnavalkya, said he, explain to me the Brahman that is immediate and direct, the self that is within all. This is your self that is within all. Which is within all, Yajnavalkya? That which breathes through the prana is your self that is within all. That which moves downwards through the apana is yourself that is within all. That which pervades through the viana is yourself that is within all. That which goes out through the udana is yourself that is within all. This is yourself that is within all. So this is the explanation of the self. The self is Brahman. Existence, consciousness, and bliss. The self is life. And we find the self in everything that lives. Even in inanimate objects. 
So then, how is the self known? Well, it's known by its effects. That there are living creatures, that there is a world, that we ourselves are conscious and alive. And how do we know that life within our own self? That this breathes as prana. Prana is the breath specifically the outgoing breath, and then the udana, the incoming breath, and then the viana, that which expands. So these are all different types of pranas. The body is run by prana. The body, believe it or not, is a pneumatic machine. It runs by air. That air is conducted through 10,000 tiny channels called nadis. And those airs can accomplish anything because they are linked with the universal prana. Now, this is where the process of Vedic inference begins. We talked about inference in a previous video. Inference is like when you see a stream of water flowing downhill through a mountain valley, and then you see it pool in a lake. And then again, at the bottom of the lake, there's runoff, and it continues going downhill. So if you observe all of these activities, you can reason using inference, inductive logic, and say, well, since this water is going downhill, pooling in lakes, and then going downhill again as soon as it has a chance, we could imagine or we could conclude that somewhere at the bottom of everything, there's a really big lake, a reservoir of water. And of course, this is the ocean. So if we follow the water, if we follow the stream until it joins a river and follow the river to its end, we find there is an ocean, and that's confirmed. Similarly, when we see phenomena in the body, like breathing in, breathing out, the expansion and contraction of the whole body with the breath, we have to say, if these forces exist, if these airs, these winds, these pranas exist in the body, and they demonstrate various functions, such as breathing in, breathing out, and so on, there must somewhere be a reservoir of all pranas, because the prana that's in our body gets there through the air that we breathe. That's how we get prana. We literally inhale it. That means the prana is present in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is in space. And in space, there must be a reservoir of prana. Maybe we can't see it. Maybe we can't go there, but wait a minute. Maybe we can and the way we can is through meditation. By meditating on prana, one can realize the reservoir of prana, which is Hiranyagarbha, or Vishvanara, as it's called. Vishva means everywhere, and Nara means men, human beings. So the Vaishvanara is the collection or the aggregate, or the ocean of all the pranas, of all the subtle components of all the beings that exist anywhere forever. Okay? So this Vaishvanara, this is the personality, or this is the entity of the Jagrat consciousness, consciousness of the world, of the senses, and of the phenomena perceived through the senses. Now, these phenomena are all temporary. 
But the Vaishvanara itself transcends these temporary phenomena and is immortal, at least for the duration of the universe. So it's a kind of God. And indeed, Brahma, the creator God, is identified with this Vaishvanara. Sometimes he's called Hiranyagarbha, the golden egg. And he is in the mode of passion. So the mode of passion, which means desire and the quest to fulfill desire, is activated by the breathing in and breathing out. And the Buddha agrees. He says breathing in and breathing out is fabrication of the body. This is how the body is created, how it is maintained, and how it lives. So, prana is worshipped as the self. Not that prana is the self, but because within every effect, the cause is latent. Just as the effect is latent within the cause. So, if we look for the cause of prana itself, that can only be the reservoir of all life, of all energy, of all beingness, of all perception, and of all happiness and enjoyment. And this is Brahman, by definition. Therefore, Brahman is present in the body as prana, at least in the state of Jagrat consciousness, when the consciousness, our attention, is focused on the external senses and the world that they reveal. We know this from such Shruti texts as there is no other witness but him, and there is no other witness but this, as well as this self has entered into these bodies and it is inferred from its functions of speech, etc. So, we just went over the concept of how the existence of subtle entities can be inferred by their effects. So, prana, and related to prana, of course, is speech, because you have to have a breath to speak. Without breath, without breathing, no one can say anything, right? <laughs> so, related to prana are these different effects, not only speech, but actually all the bodily functions. Because, like I said, this body is a pneumatic machine. It's powered by air. Air going through the thousands of nadis. And when that air goes through one certain nadi, out of all these 10,000 nadis, huh? the sushumna, this nadi goes from the heart up through the third eye to the top of the head. This is how enlightenment takes place. So we should become very familiar with these functions and characteristics of prana. Meditate on them and so on. Now, as far as these quotes, there is no other witness but him, comes from Brihadaranakopanishad, 3723. He who inhabits the organ of generation but is within it, whom the organ does not know, whose body is the organ, and who controls the organ from within, is the internal ruler, your own immortal self. He is never seen, but is the witness. He is never heard, but is the hearer. He is never thought, but is the thinker. He is never known, but is the knower. There is no other witness but him, no other hearer but him, no other thinker but him, no other knower but him. He is the eternal ruler, your own immortal self. Everything else but him is mortal. Thereupon Udalika, the son of Aruna, kept silent. What a wonderful quote. <laughs> what a powerful verse, huh? Well, this verse is part of another story in a previous chapter that talks about how 
Udalika questioned Yagyavaltya because he didn't really understand the self. And <laughs> when it was explained like that, he shut up. <laughs> he stopped questioning. He got it. So this is a great story. And the other quote is actually a part of the same story. There is no other witness but this. This immutable, O Gargi, is never seen but is the witness. It is never heard but is the hearer. It is never thought but is the thinker. It is never known but is the knower. There is no other witness but this, no other hearer but this, no other thinker but this, no other knower but this. By this immutable, O Gargi, is the unmanifested ether pervaded. Ether means akasha, or we would call it today space. The five basic Vedic elements are earth, water, fire, air, and akash. So we would call those today in the magic uh, physics parlance <laughs> solids, liquids, ions, or plasma, gas, and space, space-time, the space-time continuum. So here, talking to his wife Gargi, Yagyavalka is making a comparison between the self and space. Now, what is a comparison or what is a simile? Huh? A simile is a comparison of two things that are similar. Now, actually, no two things that you can find anywhere are identical. But they do have certain similarities. For example, they exist. <laughs> you have to think of it like that and separate all the qualities from the object itself. So what is it about space and Brahman that are similar? Well, they're both very subtle. They're both a kind of emptiness or no thingness. There's no things to be perceived within them. They are both frictionless and unattached. They are both never the effect of anything. In other words, you can do whatever you want in space. Space is never affected. And the same with Brahman. They are both infinitely potent and creative. Space isn't empty. We know from physics that it is the ground of existence, of conditioned material existence, but still, it is an imperceptible network of latent forces which can be conjured up from empty space simply by creating a polarity. Now, there's very simple physics experiments that prove this. I'm not going to go into the physics of it, but space is basically full of latent energy. And similarly, Brahman, although invisible, uh, like space, although apparently insubstantial like space, is also full of immense energies. And the proof is this universe. This universe is, well, we can't say exactly created by Brahman, but arises within Brahman by its potencies. So its potencies are immense, inconceivable, immense, just immense. So this self has entered into these bodies. Let's look at that quote. This universe was then undifferentiated. It differentiated into name and form. It was called such and such and was of such and such form. So to this day, it is differentiated into name and form. It is called such and such and is of such and such form. This self has entered into these bodies up to the tip of the nails 
as a razor may be put in its case, or as fire which sustains the world may be in its source. People do not see it, for viewed in its aspects, it is incomplete. When it does the function of living, it is called the vital force. When it speaks, the organ of speech. When it sees, the eye. When it hears, the ear. And when it thinks, the mind. These are merely its names according to functions. He who meditates upon each of this totality of aspects does not know, for it is incomplete being divided from this totality by possessing a single characteristic. The self alone is to be meditated upon, for all these are unified in it. Of all these, this self alone should be realized, for one knows all these through it, just as one may get an animal through its footprints. He who knows it as such obtains fame, and association with his relatives. Another amazing dynamite verse. Huh? So when we speak, it is the self speaking. When we see, it is the self seeing. When we think or know, that is also the self. So it is known by its functions. If there is speaking, if there is living, seeing, hearing, and so forth, somewhere there has to be an aggregate, a source, an ocean, from which these individual functions are derived. Just like the example of the water in the stream being derived from the ocean and then returning back to the ocean. What happens when the body is finished? All of these phenomena cease, and their energy returns to the source. The energy returns to Brahman. It goes back into the reservoir from which it was derived in the first place. So this is the nature of Brahman. And just like one may track an animal through the woods by footprints and eventually then get it, means if it was a lost animal like a sheep or cow, one can bring it back again. Or uh, if it was a game animal, one can shoot it and kill it or whatever. But this, this is a crude simile, <laughs> another inferential simile of how by its action, by its symptoms, we can identify or at least we can presume or infer the existence of Brahman. From there, it's only a matter of meditating because since every phenomenon contains its cause in latent form within it, by meditating on it and going deep into it and reaching its core, we can realize its source as well. So even though the meditation on these different things is partial, incomplete, because it's just a single function out of many, many infinite numbers of functions the self performs. Still, by going deeper and deeper until one reaches the essence, one can understand that all these different phenomena originate in Brahman. They are the result of the existence and consciousness and bliss of Brahman. They are created by Brahman, enjoyed by Brahman, and eventually enter back into Brahman at the end. It's just like the example of the pot. In the beginning, the pot is not. It's just clay in the ground, next to some river, in the mud, right? So then somebody takes that mud and dries it, and cleans it, and refines it, and strains it, and then fashions it into a pot on a potter's wheel. Then we say, oh, it's a pot. But then when the pot grows old and wears out and is broken, we throw it on a pile somewhere, and it's gradually reabsorbed back into the earth, where it again becomes clay. 
But wait a minute. The clay was the same before making the pot, during the existence of the pot, after the pot is broken. Those same particles of clay existed simply in different names and forms. And in the same way, Brahman is the root substance of everything. It's not exactly a substance, but let's call it like that for the purposes of the explanation. It's the origin of everything. It's the material of everything. It's the essence of everything. But in its normal, unconditioned form, it's invisible, cannot be sensed by anything. Huh? Like Ramana Maharshi says, you cannot see the self. You can only be the self. So the only way to understand or realize Brahman in that context is to look into every phenomenon that apparently arises from the self, as it were. Huh? <laughs> we'll get into that phrase, as it were, uh, quite deeply in this discussion. And then it will be known by that name. Speaking, thinking, eating, dreaming, or whatever it is. Life in general. That is the essence of the self. So we know from the texts of the Shruti that Brahman exists, and we can infer its existence and its reality by observing the various phenomena in and around the body. But how can we know Brahman directly? I mean, inference, reason, is not a very satisfactory tool for revealing Brahman. Like we can hear about it, or we can know about it, but we cannot know it directly except through Jnana Yoga, directly realizing it in Turiya consciousness. So the rest of this discussion is going to go step by step from ordinary external consciousness through the various layers of sleep and dreams and so on, which, you know, never leave us, actually. <laughs> and trace those all back to their original source, which is nothing but the supreme Brahman within everything. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.